Hello and welcome to the Wisconsin Drunken History Podcast. We are your hosts, Eric Sturgeon. And I'm Russell Sorry. This podcast is about all things Wisconsin, history, music, and culture. While drinking a few brews. Though we don't often use strong language, the jokes and the content is not intended for young audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Before we begin the episode, we have to give a huge shout out to the Dangits from Madison, Wisconsin for providing us with great bluegrass intro you hear at the beginning of every episode. The song Razzle was written by Jamie Lampkins, but is performed by on behalf of Tom Wasselchuk and the Dangits. If you have a chance, check these guys out at dang, D-A-N-G, dash it's, dot com for upcoming shows, music, or on how to book them for weddings, parties, and etc. Thank you for listening. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Wisconsin Drunken History Podcast. We are your hosts, Eric Sturgeon. And I'm Russ Sorry. We have a special episode about another legend in the Wisconsin Brewing Archives. Our main story today is about Joseph Schlitz of Schlitz Beer, the beer that made Milwaukee famous as it is dubbed. Uh, we also have Wisconsin music from Pine Travelers, a Brewski Reviewski. Another edition of the infamous How Many Locos You At. <laughs> we like to get as wild as we can on that. Uh, as well as a special interview with 608 Brewing. Uh, remember, if you have not already, please subscribe to the Wisconsin Drunken History Podcast on your favorite streaming platform. Like us, save us, however it goes on whatever platform you listen on. Uh, that's in order to uh, stay up to date on whatever you know uh, uh, we put out and your favorite half-assed history lesson that we put out. <laughs> also, a quick reminder that uh, we have merch for sale on T Public. If you go to T Public, simply type in Wisconsin Drunken History, or if you type in Wisconsin Drunken History podcast on Google, T Public is one of the ones that comes up as well as our website, which is projectcapestudio.com. Um, so we have uh, um, all of those different things with uh, graphics provided by our friend, Steph. So without any further ado, here is the story about Joseph Schlitz and the beer that made Milwaukee famous. Born on May 15, 1831 in Mainz, Germany, he migrated to the United States in 1850 at the age of 18. He started his career as Miller, merely a bookkeeper at a tavern owned by August Krug. When August Krug passed away in 1858, Schlitz married his widow, Anna Marie Krug, and changed the brewery's name to the Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company in 1861. Krug's nephew, August Uleim, Still work there, and this name will be mentioned later on in the story, so so please listen up for that name because it's going to be important later on. One thing that is often a myth about Schlitz is that he offered up a thousand barrels of beer to the Chicago population after the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. This is not true, but he pushed this as a marketing campaign which helped him sell beer. And due to the Chicago Fire, many of the beer producers of Chicago were wiped off the map, allowing Milwaukee to become the mega center of beer production, and it is still today. This marketing scheme worked, and Chicago bought tons and tons of Schlitz products. And due to the main lines at the time, including the Milwaukee Railroad, which later became the Sioux Line, it was easy to get the product down to Chicago, driving the beer to be the leader in beer sales. Tide houses were set up along the city and among the city's residents, and they sold the beer, which actually helped promote it to be a huge beer at the time. Yeah, Schlitz is honestly one of one of my favorite Wisconsin brewed beers that's on that more large level. And Joseph Schlitz actually didn't live to be very long. Um, he passed away at a sea at, at sea on May seventh of eighteen seventy five on a trip back to New York from Hamburg, Germany. Uh, aboard the SS Schiller. In a thick fog, the Schiller hit a rock on an island that lie 26 miles west of Cornwall, Indian. England. <laughs> England. My <laughs> gosh, this beer. That was good. Schlitz, among the 340 other passengers, were all lost. His body was recovered and buried at the Forest Home Cemetery in Milwaukee, and August Uleim took over the brewery upon his death. His death struck the company hard, and in 1902, due to everything he set up, Schlitz began, became the largest producer of beer, surpassing Pabst, 
who had the claim of the fame of being the largest brewery in America, producing one million barrels of beer. Wow. That's a lot of beer for the time period. I mean, populations were a lot less than two, so this guy was top dog. I mean, I could probably drink that much, but... Yeah, me too. <laughs> When Prohibition struck, to keep their, their head above the water, they switched to brewing beer. Instead of brewing beer, they brew beverages and changed their name, the beer, and changed their slogan, their famous slogan, the beer that made Milwaukee famous, to the drink that made Milwaukee famous. And when Prohibition ended, Schlitz would again achieve top sales of any beer in 1934. So they actually, you know, like a lot of breweries of the time period, they switched to either sodas or, you know, something that was legal at the time. Like Pabst, for example, made the malt. You yeah. know, a malt that people still homebrew their own beer with, but they could still sell the malt extract. Well, right. You know? Right. And a lot of companies did various things like to survive. Ice cream, I've heard sodas, I've heard cheese, Pabst cheese, uh, malt, you know, just selling the malt sugars for cooking, but people yeah. made homebrew with it. I mean... Well, of course. I mean, hey, uh, you're not going to stop people from uh, being, uh, uh, you know, I guess, ingenious and, and doing their own thing and... I mean, there is no secret about how to do uh, beer or, you know, other things that you make right at your house that you could probably go to the store and buy. Yeah, there's four simple ingredients in beer. Anybody can make right. it. I mean, really, malt but sugar. You got hops, yeah. yeast, and water. That's all you need to make beer. It's very, very, uh, it, it's a, it's an easy process, but you have to be willing to do it. Exactly. So in 1953, the Milwaukee brewery workers across the city went on a 76-day strike that impacted production at all the facilities, including Schlitz, which allowed Anheuser-Busch, boo. Yeah, boo. To surpass. Boo. Yeah, you know, I've never been a Bud drinker. Not not Bud or Bud Light, but their Bush Light is pretty, pretty their, damn Their Bush tasty. Light's not bad. It's one of the uh, kind of go-to cheap beers. If I just need something. That's the thing. I it's, mean, it's literally just like it's carbonated water with a little alcohol in it to yeah. tell you the truth I, and i like it it's it's not like dehydrating you know it's it's probably you, you could know. drink a hundred of them in a day and you'd probably be fine so in iowa bush light is like a top dog i mean it's a big deal in iowa if you go to iowa people are probably drinking bush light yeah it's like gatorade yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's so, why they don't have a professional sports team so anheuser-busch ended up taking over the number one beer sales and uh Schlitz to compete ended up making a cheaper version called Old Milwaukee, which is actually another I've drank, beer. Drank the hell out of that. I've drank some Old Milwaukee, and they would continue to battle for the number one seat. However, it remained the number two largest producer until as late as 1976. That's yeah, that's honestly crazy though, because considering, I mean, there was a lot of different beer producers, beer brewers, even yeah, in, even exactly. in the 70s. So the the fact that uh, Schlitz remained at uh, that number two spot for until 76 is crazy. I mean, you know, Wisconsin, we're, we're lucky to have a lot of beer manufacturers. I mean, there was Miller, Blatz, Schlitz. Uh, Meisterbrow was Meister part Brow, of Meisterbrow, Lacrosse, the standard, you know, the uh, Chippewa Falls. Like yeah. we've, we had a lot of beers. A lot of beers. In 1967, so the name I mentioned before for uh, August Uline, his grandson, Robert Uline Jr., uh, was trying to meet, you know, he took over the company after August. Took So it goes, Joseph Schlitz was passed to August, was passed to his son, Robert. Yeah. And they were trying to meet large volume while cutting costs in uh, the original process for making the beer was changed in the 1970s, replacing some of the barley with corn syrup, adding silica gel to reduce the haze high temperature fermentation and substituting ingredients for cheaper products, thus making the beer spoil quicker and rapidly losing its appeal to the public, which I think was a bad mistake on their part because Schlitz, you know, now is they produce the old recipe again and it's actually a pretty tasty brew. And if you have a chance, I really recommend you going and pick it up and giving it a shot because it's a decent lager you know, if you're going for the cheaper brews, it's definitely up there on, on quality. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, uh, I mean, the Uline name you probably recognize in the Milwaukee area. Uh, the old soccer team, I guess, was uh, the, the Rampage. Um, and then it became the Wave. And, and um, those, they have uh, uh, the Uline Soccer Park. And Uline is just kind of a, another business in the in the area as well. Um so I mean, you definitely recognize the 
the name Uline other than just for for Schlitz. And, and in fact, you you may not even recognize it for Schlitz other than you know if you if you read anything about the the, the history of the company. So these bad business decisions um, and the addition of adding adding silica gel, which was forced to be labeled required by the FDA, caused him to use a different su- substance labeled as Chillguard, which reacted badly to the beer and which caused 10 million bottles to be recalled and costing them $1.4 million in sales, which is huge during the time period. I mean, $1.4 million a day, it's a lot of money, and I, I'll never see that much money, but I'm saying back then that was a big deal. This, along with failed television campaign and another strike on June 1st, 1981, the company was sold off to the Stroll Brewing Company in Detroit, Michigan. The brewery had was stood unused and was destroyed in 2013. And so the 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 television campaign that failed it was one of these, you know, forceful advertisements where like you need to drink us or else kind of thing. So a lot of people assumed like it was just too aggressive marketing campaign. Sure. And it really caused them to taper down. It's like, I think one reporter joked that it's like, you drink Schlitz or we'll kill you kind of thing. Like, it was aggressive, you know? It's And, and I mean, just just think of your own personal uh, uh, buying, uh, you know, habits. Uh, you don't necessarily buy something because it's uh, forceful. Right. And, like, all things, I mean, when you cheapen something, you're going to get less quality. Well, you know? and, and, and as soon as somebody says this has this silica gel or it has this chill guard people are going to instantly say oh that's awful that makes the product less of beer uh less about beer less you know flavorful the the, the rumors are going to start and then somebody's going to to you know that 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 starts the bad press yeah starts the bad uh the bad name and then all of a sudden you're going to see like they said 10 million bottles of beer 1.4 million dollars you know you're going to lose. Lose out every time. And like we mentioned before, the Rye Heiskabu, which was set in Germany, um, a lot of these breweries tried to hold to that. It's where you just have your simple ingredients. So you have co- uh, hops, yeast, water, and malt or barley. Right. And, you know, a lot of places I tried to deviate that. And there still are some today that use corn sugar. And- I could imagine back in the 80s, too, back in the 70s and 80s, that was probably a, a really common thing. I mean, they were trying... Just think of when all of these uh, uh, fast food restaurants started to pop up. That's seventies and eighties, right? Right. Before that, you know, it was you know real restaurants. Yeah, for not sure. how do how do we mass produce a a, a burger? You know, and, and 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 so I'm I'm assuming that a lot of these companies started to you know start figuring that stuff out. How do we how do we cheapen something? How do we make more of it, but you know, spend less money. And then also, you know, TV dinners and stuff like that started to come out. How do we be able to utilize the microwave in in more ways? So it, I'm sure that that impacted all these other industries that maybe we didn't hear about, uh, but you know, here we are reading about this silica gel and uh, you know, chill guard or whatever. Right, and it was just a way to cheapen it up. But at the same time, like you don't want your boy beer to spoil. I mean, no. I, I've drank PBR that was super old. And it was not that bad. I mean, maybe a little skunky from sitting, getting warm, cold, warm, cold. But right. I mean, you do not want your beer to spoil. You want to be able to drink that. You know, you're not always going to be able to get to your beer right away. So right. So Schlitz became more and more obscure through the years and became a cheap beer. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily a cheap beer today. You know, in 1999, it was purchased by the Pabst Brewing Company due to its ac- their acquisition of Stroh Brewing Company. And it was relaunched and is still available today and in most stores. Um, it's now headquartered in L.A. along with Old Milwaukee and Pabst. And you can still buy these today, you know. And, and obviously a lot of Wisconsinites have heard the rumors that they were coming back. And I, I really do hope it does because they are true Milwaukee staples. I mean, they, they still have a lot of, uh, uh, so like Schlitz itself still operates a lot of stuff here in Milwaukee. Uh you can go to the old Schlitz uh, mansion uh, and, and stuff too. Um, there's there's still things here in, in the Milwaukee and Wisconsin area that, that still don the name. Yeah, and, you know, Pabst Brewery has really brought it to the forefront again where Pabst is coming back, Schlitz is coming back. Old, like all these old brands are bringing back. And which... Pabst is actually not, I mean, some people imagine that it's that it's run out of, uh, you know, California or whatever, but it, it did. It came back to Milwaukee. It's here. It's brewed by Miller. They have a contract with them, but it's it's headquartered and everything right here in, in Milwaukee. Um, it, it still isn't, and and I know with the the recent 
acquisition of uh, Miller to Coors and, you know, the, the brand is basically going away. The, the, the problem is that uh, Pabst is finding it hard to, um, to maintain its, its contract with Miller because Miller is, Miller's really on its way out. I mean, Miller really screwed themselves with uh, the naming rights of uh, Miller Park. Uh, not, not, not even really. I, I think within the next probably ten years, M- Miller will not be. Uh, I don't even know if if uh, things will continue to be branded that, but I honestly don't believe that it's going to be a thing. You know the 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 Miller Coors acquisition. Um, luckily, they own the Coors brand because it's pretty big throughout the United States. So I think Miller will still be around. I think it's going to become more obscure, you know, as but as years go on. As far as I know, it's owned by like the Anheuser name. A- I, it's uh, um, it, Anheuser is the one who purchased basically all of it. It's the uh, uh, something Bev company is in is Bev. what in Bev. Yep, yeah, and yeah. that's all Anheuser. Okay, I mean how how it all went through, I don't know because you you would imagine that the United States government would have had. Uh, basically put a block on that because it would end up being a a monopoly, a monopolization of the the beer and brewery uh, um, uh, uh, marketing and and all of the business. But I don't know how it all worked, but it did. Anheuser InBev is is basically the, the owner of all of that Miller Coors, all of it. And I used to drink Goose Island, but I know um, Bud, Budweiser bought them out. And yeah. they really, their beer has gone downhill. I, I honestly don't drink it anymore. It's not what it is. It's not what it was. I mean, they, they totally cheapened it up. And uh, I'm sure due to the cost of hops and, you know, to keep up with that flavor, it's not cheap. For the, And they're trying to make the cheapest beer possible, the most profit. The most profit is really what it comes down to. So another fun fact about the, uh, the, the Schlitz beer is uh, the sitcom Laverne and Shirley. We all know it. Um, they were it. workers at the Schatz Brewery taking a stab at the yeah, Schlitz, Schlitz Brewery. Yep. And, uh, w- you know, shout outs to the Pabst Brewing Company. Um, they, uh, they, fe- they were featured in, in strategic placement in the AMC drama Mad Men, which really helped the brand. Yeah, we, we featured uh, a little bit of a, a, a placement for Mad Men on the Koss episode. Yeah. yeah. Um, because they were also a, you know, a... a what is it like a, an account for, you know, the, the main marketing guy in Mad Men? Yeah, exactly. And uh, so, yeah, please go out and uh, grab some of these beasts and uh, let us know what you think about the new Schlitz, you know, the beverage. Um, if you have parents, ask them to taste it and let them know, you know, have them let you know how close it was to the original recipe if they were around. Right. And, I, and personally, I tasted a difference between, you know, the first Schlitz I ever had versus the Schlitz that I drink now. I believe that it feels like a more wholehearted, full-bodied recipe versus what it used to be. So you let us know. Let us know if your if your parents know. Hey, if you're a listener and you uh, and had the opportunity to have you know the original Schlitz recipe back in you know even like the 50s or 60s, let us know you know what the difference is here. Yeah, and Joseph Schlitz lived a short life, but uh, his his story needs to live on, and that's why we featured him. And that's going to conclude the main segment for today, but please stay tuned. All right. We have another Wisconsin music segment here. Uh, Today's artist is the Pine Travelers. They are uh, from the Madison, Wisconsin area. They're uh, uh, kind of a mix between, you know, folk, roots, rock, uh, bluegrass, uh, even jam bandish. I mean, they've got a bunch of different flavors that that sort of encompass and, and come together to really make what they are yeah we've had a few listeners kind of request um you know this this band um they're really good i really enjoy them i've had multiple people ask me about them i like them i've listened to them multiple times but uh yeah today we have the pine travelers golden coast Woo. Track. Law men want to put me in jail 
Walked it to the silver spoke the local saloon Threw my wild card on the floor Things were looking heavy in the crowded bar room Piano man ran out the door Don't never let yourself get caught Between an outlaw and his gun Take the train that curves and quakes Toward the golden coast of the sun In avalanche skies are tumbling, coming down fast. Sometimes you gotta saddle up and ride. Don't ever let yourself get caught between an outlaw and his gun. Take the train that curves and quakes toward the golden coast. And that was great Wisconsin music from the Pine Travelers. That one was called Golden Coast. It is absolutely phenomenal, along with the rest of their stuff. Please go to their social media pages. Also find them on Spotify and iTunes, uh, Bandcamp, everywhere. And here is another fine beverage review. So today we're drinking the uh, Thirsty Miner Double IPA from the Rhinelander Brewing Company, coming in at 8.6% ABV. This beer is currently being brewed in Monroe by Minhas. Yeah, yeah. But eventually they're going to move it up to the Rhinelander area, which we both had a great time up there um, seeing the Hodag. Our friends Ben from the Hodag store and uh, Carrie at Pioneer Park. It was great seeing both those guys and yeah. uh, having some good brewskis while we were up there. And Yeah, the uh, the Hodag uh, brew we, we did on uh, a past episode there too. Uh, after grabbing a uh, piece of that limited edition, that was great. But this is also fantastic. It is a double 
IPA, which is a fistful. Um, this thing is delicious yet it's aggressive. A pu- it's a punch in the D. I mean, it's great. And uh, what better way to describe this, Russ? You said it's a a uh, a punch. I said it's a fistful. Look at the thirsty miner logo on this bad boy. It's a fist in the air with some miners surrounding it. It's a green can. <laughs> Um, it says working up a powerful thirst on it and yeah. it's, it's Woo. definitely good. You know, the one thing, the only thing I can say about this beer, it's, it's a little dry, but you're going to get that with the 8.9% ABV. It's probably one you're not going to want to drink all day. Cause you are going to be wrecked. Oh, and it's 8.6 by the way. This thing is aggressive though. Um, yikes. The uh, bitterness is coming through a lot. You're getting a lot of the upfront malt. It did. Yeah. It's very malty. Yeah, I'm getting a lot more malt than I am hop. I'm kind of getting a little bit of the pine hop, but it's because the alcohol coming through so hard that you're getting more of that dry finish to it. Yeah. You get a little bit, I'm guessing it must be a cascade hop or a drier, pinier hop is what I'm thinking is in this right. one. Yeah, and th- that definitely sounds right. I mean, um, this IPA definitely almost mimics and... and let me know if you feel the same, Russ. It almost mimics like a barrel aged kind of thing. Yeah. Are you getting that bourbony kind of feel? Yeah, it definitely. I think it's just the malt, the way that they're charring the malt or cooking the malt, or if it's a, a little bit darker. I'm guessing it's a caramel, but I'm guessing the caramel might have been a little darker caramel. I'm definitely getting that. It's aggressive, though. Yeah, it's definitely aggressive. It's. Like I said, if you're going to be doing work around the house or the farm, you're probably not going to be wanting to drink these all day. No, this will this will pretty much ruin all the work you're trying to do if you have one of these. But, yeah, it's really good. Um, it's it's available you. for very cheap. So if you go to Woodman's, you can actually get a six-pack for about $3 right now, a little over 3 bucks. Holy which, shit. Which is a great price for a double IPA, 8.9% ABV. It's, it's a really quality... I guess cheap beer, but it's not technically a cheap beer because you're actually supporting Wisconsin, Minhas, the Minhas family, Rhinelander Brewing Company, Rhinelander, Wisconsin. Which we talked about the Minhas Brewery uh, tour, I think, on, I mean, it was an early episode. It was the Lumberjack Lingo with yeah. Gary. He was talking about the Rhinelander Brewing Company in Rhinelander. Yeah. And the one thing that we both had, had sort of uh, expressed as our sentiment to the Minhas Brewing Company, was that it is an an aggressive tour. If you are looking to get pretty slopped up, I mean, they give you your fair share. Yeah, for, so th- for the 15 or whatever dollars it is to do the tour, hi-ya. It's it, worth it. It'll karate chop you in the liver for sure. So the tour is pretty good. Like, you get to hear about the uh, Huber Brewery, which is the original Minhas in Huberdorm. Yeah. Actually, the Huberdorm history, how Huberdorm started in Wisconsin. Yep. Um, you're going to get 30 minutes of unlimited drinking of beer. Yep. Yeah. Which you, is a lot. You get like the 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 uh, tasting room like all to yourself for a while with whatever group you're with, uh, and that and that's mixed groups too. It's not you don't have to have a group of like 30 of your closest friends. It, it's you and you could have you know two or three of your own you know friends, but they just put you together in a group. Um, take you through the whole thing. They do a lot of bottling and packaging and canning at their operation as well. Um, their contract brew is uh, extensive. They do a lot of contract Yes, brewing. they have the Bloomer Soda too, which is pretty good. Yeah, the sodas and the beers, um, seltzers and, and all these other things that they do right out of their brewery there. Um, and then the, um, the yeah, I mean, the, the hard sodas that they do, I mean, it... It gets aggressive. Their malt yeah. liquor thing at the end too. If you if you get that aggressive and you want to have like a couple of their grape grape malt liquor uh, drinks, whatever, they're almost for local. Yeah, they're almost local. They're nuts. Um, and they, you yeah, can get into trouble. They have the distillery tour and the wine tour. Well, the distillery is across the street, right? Yep. And yeah. then the wine's on the corner, but. I don't recommend doing all three in one day. And if you do, please make sure you stay in Monroe somewhere because you're going to get messed up. It's yeah, it, it, it's a lot. And even just the beer one is a lot. So yeah, I would designate somebody as the, as the DD, uh, no matter what. Yeah. But yeah, it's a great tour, great beer. Um, for the cost, I recommend picking it up and trying it. They also have a stout and an American pale ale thirsty miner does. So please check those out. Let us know what you think. 
um, yeah, just send us any kind of response you want. We, we'd we love to hear about this beer from you. Yeah, anything you guys got. Uh, uh, we love uh, the, the content, um, you know, the, the, the stuff that you guys are able to, to help provide as uh as comment to any of our content so yeah and one of our longtime listeners ryan yep um he was the one who got me into this and uh yeah he has a farm kind of close to my farm and uh, he's just a really good guy and uh, ryan well, really got us got us into this yeah so hopefully we really uh, stepped in it now hopefully we can get him on the show he's been a longtime fan since the beginning so uh, yeah yeah that'll be awesome all right so now for another how many local you at segment? Oh, yeah, yeah, this one's aggressive. Um, so here, here we are in in a a great uh, state uh, in a great city. <laughs> this is Kenosha, Wisconsin. So the individual was stopped by a Wisconsin state patrol trooper. So we got a state troop uh, for going about twenty miles over the speed limit. Uh, on the uh, I-94 in the Kenosha County area. Uh, Officials say that four unrestrained children under the age of 16 were also in the vehicle. Um, The officers say a strong odor of marijuana was present uh, with an open container of vodka also in the car. So uh, this individual was arrested for operating while intoxicated and transported uh, to a local hospital for a blood, blood draw, rather. Um, she was later held at the uh, Kenosha County Jail, which is probably an awful place, I can only imagine. Uh, police say that the uh, the individual was also cited for speed, operating without insurance, keeping open intoxicants in a vehicle, and operating well suspended. Oof. So she is not a good character either way. Uh, all of these things against her... Uh, the, the notable ones here operating without insurance and also uh, operating well suspended. Uh, and then the largest thing was um, the, the additional passengers in the vehicle all under the age of 16, all unrestrained, uh, terrible, terrible, terrible stuff. They no nobody was hurt in this. That's the number one thing we want to talk about is that um, no, nobody is hurt. There, there is no accident involved. Uh, the kids were were released back to uh, an individual who was uh, of uh, property or uh, proper authority. Um, uh, a good consenting adult is what we want to say. Okay, so so we we got a few things to break down here. Um, so our person is probably around the age of thirty. I'm guessing around thirty ish. If she has younger kids under sixteen, she has vodka, marijuana. Yeah, yeah, strong smell of marijuana. Uh, an open intoxicant of. Uh, vodka in the vehicle okay um so th- so there's a few things to break down here um traveling 20 miles over the speed limit and that's what she's originally pulled over for so she wasn't like really swerving in and out she's a younger female um probably in her early 30s maybe late 20s i'm the, guessing and this one could very well be a real loco she might actually enjoy some loco some malt liquor some of that uh this is kenosha some watermelon with Satan like a 30 drink. to 35 year old i don't know kids that's loco. That's that got might, loco that, written all over. That's it. loco territory for sure. I mean, yeah. it could. It's possibility of a loco. That checks the loco boxes. I smell loco. Uh, you know what I smell? Marijuana, and loco. Yeah. So, Watermelon, gasoline. So you know she wasn't swerving in and out of traffic, but she had four kids. She had open vodka and maybe a little, maybe a little MJ marijuana. We're talking about the devil's yeah. lettuce, the lechuga de uh, diablo. You know what I have heard, and and this is something that I do not encourage any of our listeners to do people have mixed vodka with four loco and they've made a beverage out of it i'm telling you right now it's not a good idea what what would you even call that mixed drink hell loco hell, oh, oh satan's shit. satan's nuts yeah <laughs> satan's mean, nut drip oof this is bad yeah so don't, don't try it please so she's early 30s and if you do try it be safe and then let us know about it. Yeah, also. let us know how you've fared, because <laughs> we're interested. Number one, be safe when you do it. And number two, <laughs> send us an email. So, WI Drunken History, history at, at gmail. Gmail. com. So what do you think? I mean, she's probably in her early 30s. She's a younger lady, four kids, vodka, marijuana. 
I don't know what we can factor into this. I mean, we don't know the extent because they never gave a breathalyzer or the yeah, ABV, so we can't really nothing, factor that. And nothing in particular uh, happened uh, crazy at the stop, so we just know it's a state trooper. She was speeding. Uh, you know, she's got all these uh, other ticks here. I- I'm going to go ahead and say she's probably at, um, I- I'm going to call it an eight. Yeah, I was thinking a two to two and a half can, so eight to ten. So I think an eight local is safe to say with this one. Yeah. I mean, a little marijuana, a little bit of vodka. Yeah, the old uh what is that? The old the crazy bootka, cabbage. The vodka. I don't know. Like I don't I don't recommend the drinking devil's lettuce. Yeah, the 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 potato liquor of vodka too in general, the clear liquors, oof. Yeah. You can get some 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 well, problems with p- that. Potato vodka tastes better than uh Original vodka. Original, yeah, regular vodka. I mean, vodka is just basically your basic liquor. It's just your clear alcohol. Yeah, um, yeah I'm, I'm saying I'm an thinking eight, eight loco, too. Eight I think, is, I think eight you is nailed absolutely it. right. I think you nailed it on this one. I yeah. think that's dead on. I think this all these all this evidence lines up right to an eight loco. So. Yeah. Stay, hey, stay off the road. If you're drinking, drink Wisconsinably. Drink Wisconsinably. All right, today we're here with Phil from 608 Brewing Company. How are you doing? So, can you tell us a little bit about the history of uh, 608, how you guys got started? Yeah, so, uh, basically, I started homebrewing probably, was probably seven years, eight years ago, um, and uh, just fell in love with trying to create beers that I couldn't buy in the store, and um, like every homebrewer, well, not every homebrewer, but a lot of homebrewers, you know, just kind of created like a brand for yourself. Uh, just for fun, never really thinking it's going to go anywhere. And um, by the time I got around to uh, opening the brewery, um, people already locally already kind of affiliated myself with Six Away Brewing Company. So instead of trying to create a new brand or name, I just kind of stuck with it. And, you know, here we are. Awesome. Awesome. And, and yeah, we were wondering so we've had some Six Away Brews. Um, is there any beer you recommend us giving a shot? Uh, yeah, I guess it really depends on what you're into. You know, we're kind of all over the place, you know. We're doing the, the pastry sours and the pastry stouts, and then you know a lot of IPAs, and I uh, even started dabbling the lagers, uh, just because it's getting hard hard for me to want to drink all these crazy flavorful things yeah. more than like a few ounces. Um, but I mean, I, I'm pretty uh, pretty happy with our IPAs we've been coming out with lately. Uh, just released. Uh, Alpha Burst, which is a triple IPA that I've really been digging, and then uh, uh, Face Hammer, which is a kind of a funny story. My kid, uh, well, it was probably you know, actually a homebrew we made a long time ago, and he was you know, like four or five years old, and he, I don't know what he was, he, we were talking about like how, so I get like kind of punched in the face, and he's, he's like, yeah, uh, uh, you can brew the Face Hammer today, so you know, kind of. <laughs> You know, silly name, so I figured I'd run with it. But uh, that one I, I, I like a lot because it's kind of a blend of uh, New England style with the uh, IBUs of a West Coast IPA. Yeah, I know we're we're both big fans of like the bitter IPAs, pale ales. They're kind of like our go-to beers and uh, ones I always bring with me if I ever go overseas because people can't get that kind of beer in a lot of places. So, yeah, I love those beers. Yeah, we actually have. Um, I'm pretty excited for it. Um, I'm guessing it probably won't sell that well, but it's uh, okay. uh, not this week. But two weeks from now, uh, we're hoping to drop a, a West West Coast style IPA. It's, a, it's around 100 IBUs and uh, a little bit over 8 percent ABV. Awesome! Yeah, uh, that that'll definitely good. be something that Russ and I like. Yeah, and so we were wondering. Yeah, I know. I, I like it. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I was gonna say I'll, I'll, just, I'll send you guys some since I dropped the ball and getting some this time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no worries. No, that'll be awesome. And so we were wondering. I know with COVID things have been a little weird with breweries and uh, dining out. Um, do you guys have any standard events that you're offering currently? Uh, well, yeah, it's like uh, it's been tough to do anything. Honestly, I just didn't wanna. You don't want to like do something you know is going to attract a ton of people in there. I mean, you do as a business owner, but you don't from the public eye. Uh, so, you know, like we got our bar seating gone. Uh, basically, it became like a line to walk through the order. And the tables are spaced out, and you know we're got like signs on there. People flip over when they're done, so we go out there and clean them. And I'm just just dealing with that alone is already 
you know, kind of causes us to have an extra person on staff the whole time. just kind of try to keep everything clean. So we haven't done many events um, just because of the whole not wanting to uh, bring bad press upon ourselves or, you know, some people just still aren't comfortable being around other people. Um, and then when they, they roll into an establishment like that, they just assume we don't care if we're, if we're packed. And um, the, the next one I have kind of lined up is coming uh, Black Friday-ish. We usually do try to do a pretty nice beer release that day. Um, this year we'll be, we have our uh, collaboration we do with Forager Brewing out of Rochester, uh, Minnesota. It's a 13.5% barrel-aged old ale. And um, I've been trying to figure out how we can do this uh, without it being a problem because if you put Forager's name on something, uh, people people tend to flock to it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So it's, it's gonna be I don't know. It's gonna be a rough, <laughs> rough next few months just to figure this stuff out because we're going into the time of year too, where a lot of people, you know, they're, they're spending money at that time of year, getting Christmas presents, getting all that stuff. So uh, it's just constant adapt, adapting to you know the the environment. It doesn't help that you know Cross has kind of been a hot spot uh, for COVID in the state with all the colleges so I don't know it's, uh, it's tough so we haven't really done much honestly just because we like I said we don't want to bring bad press upon ourselves or put, or put our employees in, in a dangerous situation either so. exactly and it's kind of it, it's just trying to chart rough waters you know I definitely uh I, I know that you, you know all of these uh, uh businesses and stuff are in in, in sort of a, a tough spot so yeah, and with the weather changing too, we're losing the outdoor space. You know, we just we don't have a huge outdoor space anyway. It's probably like you know, four tables and then a, a little standing area. So that's been popular all summer, and even the days where it's not like rainy or you know snow misting or whatever. Right. That uh, people people are still hanging out there, but because um, I mean it was a definite in the last week when it was a little chillier, it was a definite drop off in sales. You could tell. Yeah. All right, Phil, um, before we let you go, uh, before we let any of our guests go, we always ask them a few questions to find out how Wisconsin they are. Are, uh, are you willing to participate? Oh, yeah, let's go for it. All right, sounds good. So question one we got for you. Have you ever eaten a squeaky cheese curd? Uh, yeah, I actually did two days ago. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah, same here. Um, have you ever tailgated at a Brewers, Packers, or a Badgers game? Oh, the, nice. trifecta. the trifecta. That's a perfect yeah. score there. Yeah, heck yeah. <laughs> Have you ever hit a deer? Uh, yeah, five. Five, nice. All at the same time? or? I hit, I hit three at once once when I was in high school. There you go. That's a bar fight right there. <laughs> <laughs> a Wisconsin bar fight. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever had a true muddled old-fashioned? Yeah, they're pretty tasty. It's a, it's a staple. Tasty. It's kind of a question where we probably can remove it because I think everybody in the state has had one of those at some yeah. point. Do you, is, there, is there a better way to have it? Exactly. <laughs> right. Do you, uh, do you prefer yours uh, sweet or sour? I just use sour. Yeah, that's how I always go. All right. Have you ever milked a cow? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Good. That one doesn't happen often. A lot of people haven't milked cows. That's like our most common no. I went to high school with 120 kids in central Wisconsin, and it was all farming. farming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. True, true. All right, so this question is hotly debated. Um, what do you consider to be up north? Man, yeah, I'd say anything north of, like, Medford. Okay. Yeah. Sure, sure. Hammer area. Yeah, it's kind of like me too. I mean, I always consider um, Wausau, anything north of Wausau or Highway 8, I guess, for me. I mean, that's pretty far up sure. there, but... Sure, like north, north of Highway 29 or whatever. Yeah, that's that's like actually a good point, too. I agree that's with a, that. That's a better point. I was always like under the impression that it was that anything north of the Wisconsin Dells or Delton, you know, Lake Delton. But I'm... Oh, man, that's, that doesn't seem that north to me. Either. I yeah, know, I know. <laughs> same way. <laughs> I really failed on that one, so... <laughs> All right. Have you ever been to a supper club, club and do you have a favorite... Yeah, I've been to a few. I'll be honest, it's been, the last one I went to was Ishnala. And that, that was just more or less to experience it because everyone talked about how great it was. Right, right. It's uh, really just the the views, right? 
Yeah, the views are awesome. The three R weights not desirable. Not desirable. <laughs> yeah, and I actually I think that one was rated well, number one. Honest, I've been to a few other ones, but I honestly I can't remember. I mean, there's not there's not one really close to me that. Sure. Um, that where it's not very common. All right, beer brats. And is there a six oh eight beer you recommend us giving a shot with some beer brats? Yeah, I guess I'm a little different when it comes to like the beer brats stuff. I actually like boiling them in like a dark beer. That's... I know a lot of people use like a light, you know, Miller Light or something. Um, so like, I I really like trying just like uh, I don't really have one out right now, but uh, Nebulous Boys is kind of like the beer I've done it with before. It's just a, a, a non adjuncted imperial stout. I'm gonna add that to my list. Dark beer character. I'm gonna have to start doing that, uh, using a more of a stout or a darker beer, like you said, because. We've had a few people mention that, and I, I'm, I'm more like what you said before, where it's a, a lighter beer. I just usually grab what's left over, old in the in the fridge, and uh, I mean, I would really like to see what the flavor difference is on that. Yeah, that's. I don't know. I don't know who showed it to me, and because I, I was always the same. It was like whatever crappy beer was left in the fridge that you didn't want to drink you just pour it in there with the brats <laughs> exactly yeah. Uh, yeah so so they started doing the dark beer uh, I think I've done it in like a bourbon barrel aged house before and stuff just messing around but, I mean that uh, would have to be good yeah actually you know I've never really tried a dark beer but uh, I'm gonna have to try that the uh, nebulous void is what it was called yeah uh, we don't have it all like uh, I don't know what it'll come up next honestly but it's just one I had laid around that I tried for my beer's um, but I, I'd say any any nice dark beer that's, you know, maybe a little heftier on the ABV side and kind of get some of that. And I mean, it depends how much beer you want to taste and you're proud, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, so I got one more question before we let you go, Phil. Um, besides 608 Brewing Company, is there another place you recommend um, our listeners go and check out? Another brewery tour, brewery, small, uh, nano pub, anything like that? Like in the state or just in the area around that? Uh, Honestly, I, anywhere. Yeah, we're, we're up for anything. Well, I mean, I can just run down the ones that I'm a big fan of. You guys are kind of more in the Milwaukee area, I believe, right? Yeah. So, yeah, like uh, I like the guys over at Eagle Park. They're great. Uh, Kyle over at 1840 is awesome. And then uh, uh, probably the, the one I feel like I don't hear much about, uh, at least in my part of the state, that I really like over by you guys is Venture. Um those guys over there are doing cool stuff with the whole coffee house and uh, brewery uh, in the same spot. And then, uh, you know, Funk Factory is always one of my favorites, too, in Madison, if you want to get sours. But oh, nice, yeah. It's more of a, you know, it's more like if you're not into, if you're into like, real sours, not, not, the, not the pastry sours and the, <laughs> the kettle sours. <laughs> that's usually my problem. I, you know, my wife's with me or friends, they don't, really appreciate the, the true funk sours, you know? Yeah. So, that's always a short-lived trip when I go there. Usually I'll slam down my beer. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely more of an acquired taste. Yeah. Awesome, Phil. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today, and uh, we can't wait to get out to 608 and uh, grab some beers. Yeah, just let me know when you guys roll over and take care of you. Yeah, sounds good. Awesome. And we'll definitely talk about beer. We'll probably talk your ear off about beer, honestly. We, we both are huge beer fanatics. We've made beer ourselves. So, yeah, we can't wait. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Awesome. Thanks. Have a great rest of your Sunday. All right. That concludes this episode of Wisconsin Drunken History Podcast. If you enjoyed this vulgar display of Wisconsin, we recommend you subscribe via SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, and tune in. Also, leave us a review on any one of those above-mentioned sites, and we can read one at the end of every show. Follow us on social media, and feel free to reach out, especially if there is a piece of history or weird news you'd love us to share or research, as well as highlight some local artists or music. Our website is projectcapestudio.com. I'd also like to thank my friend and past co-worker, Steph Skibak, for providing us with awesome podcast cover art as well as the Dang It's for intro and outro music, and all of you for listening. As always, watch, watch out, out for deer, deer on, on the way, way home. home.